Howdy, everybody. Hey. Hi. Hello. Um, so today what I want to do is talk about some work that we've been doing looking at calculating application attack surface uh, and some additional things that we've been doing looking at how you can use these calculations uh, as you look to in start to include security testing in your DevOps pipelines. Um, just an agenda, I'll provide a little bit of background. Um, talk about the importance of attack surface. Why is this something that is interesting? Um, we'll look at you know, what attack surface calculations, how we've, how we've used that to benefit with DevOps. And really that's looking at, um, you know, it's come out of some realities that you have to face when you start to look at integrating security tools into DevOps pipelines. Uh, we'll talk about the underlying technology, uh, hybrid analysis mapping technology that we've developed, um, funded by the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, talk about, about a couple of use cases, some things that we're doing with this right now, and some things that we're looking at doing. And we'll have some time for questions at the end. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to, you may need to wave your hand a little bit because I've got some lights shining at me. But uh, happy to answer any questions along the way. Uh, my background, just to set some context, um, again, founder, CTO, Denny Group, I'm a software developer by background uh, with a lot of uh, Java stuff in the mid to late 90s, uh, .NET stuff in the early 2000s. But really what I've spent the majority of the last 15 years doing is working with organizations to help show them how the code that they are developing and the code that they are deploying impacts the security of those organizations. So I'm a developer that has come into the world of security as opposed to being someone with a pen testing or like a network pen testing background that has come and is now looking at web and mobile apps. And so that kind of colors the view I have on these things. Uh, and I help, uh, along with some other folks, run the OWASP San Antonio chapter and have been doing some work with uh, OpenSAM benchmarking. Um, is, everybody here, who, is everybody here familiar with OWASP Zap? Anybody not familiar with Zap? If you're not yet familiar with Zap, you should download the slides and click on this link. Um, some of the examples we'll use, uh, we'll use OWASP Zap. OWASP is, uh, Zap is a freely available dynamic scanning tool and uh, maintained by Simon Bennett and uh, a worldwide group of volunteers. It's a fantastic open source project, really great community, and uh, a, a great tool that you can see kind of the things we're talking about as well as other examples of people starting to use OWASP Zap as part of their uh, CI CD pipeline. Uh, we've also got some example code bases to, that you can try the stuff that we uh, are going to be talking about here. Um, so those links are available as well. And uh, like all of the code that runs this is available. Um, you can pull down from the community edition of ThreadFix up on GitHub. And we've also got some downloads here uh, if you want to just get prepackaged stuff and not have to build things. Uh, so that's really kind of housekeeping for you know, once, uh, you know, if, if you download the slides and, want, and you have questions or want to try this stuff out. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so uh, attack surface is kind of the fundamental or the, the building block thing that we're talking about here. And that's something I think is really important for security in general. You need to know what you're trying to defend. If, if you don't know the extent of the things you're trying to defend, you're probably not going to be terribly successful in defending them just in general. And that's a big problem in you know, even small organizations, certainly organizations, large enterprises, if you just think, not even thinking from an application standpoint, just their exposure that they have. You know, different networks, different data centers, um, you know, various cloud services and things like that. In a, in, in a non-trivial organization, it can be really challenging to have an understanding of attack surface. Um, and again, if you don't know what your attack surface is, you're going to have a lot of trouble de defending it. When we talk, or when I talk about attack surface in the context of applications, specifically web applications, what I'm talking about is where can, an attacker, where can an attacker reach out and touch your application? And from a practical standpoint, this really means what are the set of HTTP requests that can be made against your application where your application is going to do some processing based on that? So what are the URLs that folks are going to be able to access? And for each URL, what are the parameters that you can pass in that will change the behavior of the application or, or other parts of the attack surface, if you think of uh, you know, HTTP headers and cookies. And so really what we're asking is, what are all the different points on your application where an attacker has the ability to send in an input that is going to have some sort of impact on the behavior of the application? <clears throat> and so looking at this is really looking at how 
the, the, what you would target when you're doing dynamic testing. You know, whether that be automated DAS, that's a nice Gartner term, dynamic uh, application security testing, uh, or looking at manual assessment or manual penetration testing of applications. So what does attack surface have to do with DevOps? Well, first of all, if you want your talk to be accepted it, these days, it has to be about DevOps. No, wait. <laughs> uh, the way we've actually started looking at this is to figure out what do we want from security in the DevOps pipeline. And to figure out, especially when you look at the constraints that you have in an organization, if you look at the time and resources it takes to do security testing, to run security testing tools, to do manual testing, what we've done is taken a really hard look at attack surface and the evolution of attack surface, and we're using that to focus in efforts because we typically have limited resources and you need to focus those resources in where they're going to be the most valuable. And we'll talk obviously more about that. Uh, you know, organizations like Etsy and Netflix are doing amazing things in their DevOps pipelines for, uh, you know, from a security standpoint to say, you know, if I were to, to deploy this build, what's the security state going to be of that deployment? Have I broken any of the assumptions that I had leading up to this? Again, those organizations are doing really, really cool stuff. When I think from an application standpoint, when I look at security in the DevOps pipeline, there's really three steps that happen or three phases that you go through during your CI CD or during your build. Uh, the first is the testing phase. You want to do some sort of testing of the application against your set of assumptions to ask, does this application have vulnerabilities in it? You know, can I discover vulnerabilities in this application? And what we've worked with organizations doing is to determine you know, some of that testing you can probably do synchronously, right? Where you are willing to wait until that testing has completed before you move forward so that you can make a decision based on that. The challenge is that in a lot of cases, if you look at the current set of security tools that are out there, and if you look at other security testing techniques like manual testing, you don't necessarily have the time to wait for all of these activities to complete. Right? If I want to run a full static analysis scan of my million line of code application, you know, I might not want my Jenkins machine like waiting and waiting and waiting. Right? I, I might need to get a, you know, again, in a perfect world, you would be able to do that because you would be able to say, well, let's do all this different testing and we're going to wait for the end of all this testing. And when all of it's done, we're going to look at the results and we're going to move forward. That's uh, you know, much more of a waterfall type of approach. And if you look at security organizations, you know, they don't necessarily have the power to enforce that, to say, no, you need to go through all of this regression, all these other things from a security standpoint before we move forward. And so a practical reality that we see a lot of organizations having to deal with is some testing can be done synchronously, where you're waiting for the results of that testing before you make a decision about failing or passing the build and moving forward. But in a lot of cases, you, you know, some of these things have to be done asynchronous. Let's kick this process off. We know it's going to complete after we've given a thumbs up or a thumbs down to this build. We're just going to have to have the communications and the processes in place to say, hey, you know that thing that we pushed out? Well, we found some things that are wrong with it. Let's use our totally awesome agile DevOps skills to quickly make fixes and push those out. <clears throat> Again, uh, not ideal, but from a practical standpoint, it's something that we see in a lot of cases. So after you've done your synchronous testing, you need to make a decision. From a security standpoint, you need to determine, do I want to pass this build or do I want to fail this build? You know, very similar to if you're running JUnit, if you're running you know, for, for unit tests, if you're running Selenium for um, uh, you know, functional tests. Right? From a security standpoint, you want to make a decision to say, is this build acceptable to move to the next stage in the pipeline or do we need to pull the cord and stop things? And again here, in an ideal world, you'd love to say, well, our policy for this application is going to be that we're not going to allow any critical or high vulnerabilities. We're going to fail the build if there are any critical or high vulnerabilities that have been identified. Um, from a practical standpoint, how many people think that that would be like a real winning strategy in your organization? Yeah. 
the challenge that we see in a lot of organizations, especially folks that have a lot of legacy code where they're trying to, instead of building new apps in, in, in pure DevOps environments where they're trying to take legacy applications and start to get those practices to take advantage of more DevOps type stuff, what you see is that you, you, know, you may have a scan and you may have an application that has some number, you know, 100 criticals or highs that are in that application, and it's simply politically not possible for you to say, well, we're not going to pass any builds for the next two weeks until this is finished, right? That's a, a potentially a losing proposition. So you may want to make decisions to say, at the very least, I don't want to, you know, politically, I can get the dev team to agree not to introduce new critical and high vulnerabilities, right? And so you've got to determine, like, what is our policy for passing a build? And in a perfect world, you'd say, you know, no vulnerabilities or no, uh, you know, no criticals and highs. From a pragmatic standpoint, that may not be something that's politically reasonable to do in your organization. And you may be able just to say, like, well, hey, we can't introduce any new SQL injections or cross-site scriptings, whatever that might be. And then after you've made a decision on the build, you need to report on that. Uh, you know, that it's back to your Jenkins server or potentially taking the results of the testing and pushing that out into the you know, developer's workflow or change tracking tools to say, we're going to take all the results that came back from this testing. Uh, we're going to bundle all the like vulnerabilities up together, and we're going to create defects in JIRA. Uh, and that's the way that the dev team is going to know that we found new things as a result of this testing. So that's really, when, when I look at security, application security in a DevOps pipeline, that's kind of the, the point of view uh, that, that I have on you know, the kind of stages you go through and the trade-offs that you have to make between what you would like to see in an ideal world or an end state that you would like to get to uh, as compared with what you're politically able to push through uh, and get all the different stakeholders to agree on. Uh, any questions about any of that so far? Excellent. Um, so, as I talked about, you know, many security tools run too long to include in a lot of pipeline builds. You know, if you're going to run you know, full static analysis of an application, if you've got a big application you, you want to run dynamic analysis, uh, you know, those are potentially long-running uh, you know, processes and that may not be acceptable to say, well, hey, we used to be able to approve a build in X amount of time, you know, in you know, 45 minutes or an hour and a half or three hours, we used to be able to do uh, you know, enough of a build. Now it takes 12 hours because we also included this other step that we're trying to go through. But also, what's, it, you know, I think it's important to understand that automation, you know, from a security standpoint, automation can't solve all of your problems. And so you're going to need to incorporate manual testing activities into your verification program. And those can be challenging, I mean, especially from a DevOps standpoint, if you're trying to build X amount of, you know, get through you know, X amount of builds per day or something like that, you know, unless you have just a weird like meat cloud of testers waiting around to like jump on new stuff. Uh, again, that's the type of, uh, you know, that's the type of uh, process that's probably going to have to happen asynchronously. But it may be one that you want to influence or kick off uh, you know, based on these uh, you know, build activities being picked, you know, uh, kicked off. And so if you look at tracking attack surface over time, that lets us potentially focus our activities on the, on, on the things that are most important. And so if I've got an application, and since I've done my last build, you know, we've introduced you know, five new URLs and 10 new parameters. If I'm doing automated testing, but I don't have a long time to do that uh, you know, for that testing cycle, I may want to say I only want to do dynamic testing on those endpoints that are new in this application, because I know those have not yet been subject to some sort of inspection. <clears throat> And that may get you and your tool runtime down to a level where it's acceptable to include in the build. Is that, is, you know, is, is that going to catch scenarios where the underlying code behind existing pieces of the attack surface have changed and may have introduced vulnerabilities? No. Uh, you know, in that case, you're, you know, if you're not testing that stuff, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna check it. But hopefully we can all agree that at least some testing or making sure that attack surface has been subject to some testing is preferable to not having any insight into the security state of that new attack surface at all. Uh, you know, similarly, if you're looking at manual testing over time, or if you have a limited set of resources for doing manual testing, if you want to do incremental manual testing, knowing how the attack surface has changed between two weeks ago when we did our last manual test and now when we've got some additional time to do testing, if I know about new attack surface, I can focus my efforts on the new attack surface because I know that that has not yet been subject to that type of testing. And so 
by understanding more about the attack surface of an application and watching how that changes over time, that lets you be much more pragmatic and intelligent about the way that you allocate your scarce resources. And that's really in the security world, I think that's the, the, you know, that's the hard problem, is making those economic decisions of how do you allocate scarce resources. Because nobody has as much, you know, nobody has as many people on their team as they want, nobody has as much time to do the testing as they want. You know, that's just a, a fact of life, is that you're going to be dealing with uh, resource constraints. And by using this attack surface information, that can help you make better decisions about where to allocate those resources. So the underlying technology that does this attack surface calculation is called the hybrid analysis mapping, uh, or HAM, as it's affectionately referred to around our office. And the original goal of building this technology was to be able to, uh, to correlate the results of static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. Uh, it's been funded via, via the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, and uh, you know, under some research and development contracts. And what we found once we had built that merging engine is that we could also use the underlying data structures to do this type of, you know, essentially we had built the attack surface calculation engine as a side effect of what we needed to do in order to do the correlation. And so what we've been doing um, you know, recently is looking for other things that we can do with that underlying technology and that attack surface calculation. Uh, just for the sake of uh, whatever, I guess you know, I probably should mention this. Uh, the DHS folks funded this research, but don't take that as an endorsement of anything that I say here today. I'm simply up here talking with my opinions about what we've done. Um, as a caveat, no, I don't want to get a call from our program manager uh, saying, you said what? But uh, so, uh, so we're currently, uh, again, phase two uh, of, a, of a DHS s and CSD SBIR, which is the, <laughs> gotta, have, gotta have the acronyms. <laughs> and I was corrected, the, the, the first time I got a call from our program manager, it was to correct some acronyms that I had left out uh, of, of some statements that I had made. <laughs> uh, but again, it's the US Department of Homeland Security, the uh, Director of Science and Technology, the Cyber Security Division, and the program is called the SBIR, or Small Business Innovation Research Program. And just as a side note, um, uh, you know, this is the first time that I've been involved in these types of uh, you know, federal government you know, R&D contracting. So it's, it's been interesting for me, uh, being someone who's spent most of my time working with private sector organizations, working with the public sector folks. Um, but it's been a really interesting program, and it's a great way. The SBIR program, what the uh, different federal uh, agencies, what they do is they determine, here are the technologies that we think would be interesting for us to accomplish our mission. And they put out a basically a request for proposal that says, "Do you think you can meet these needs?" And then they walk folks like Denim Group through a kind of uh, you know, progressive stages of uh, you know demonstrating, prototyping, and things like that. So it's been really cool to be involved in this program, and uh, you know that's allowed us to develop some technology that we probably would not have developed otherwise. And we've open sourced most of that technology, all the stuff that I'm talking about here today. Uh, you know, you can all you you can do based on the stuff that's in GitHub and whatnot. Um, and so that's been a cool way for us to develop this technology, um, you know, to, to use that for commercial benefit, but also, uh, you know, we made the decision to open source a bunch of it. Um, so whatever. Um, so again, the initial goal was to correlate the merger, or correlate and merge results from static and dynamic security tests. And after we figured out how to do that, we made it do other stuff, which is more of what I'm talking about today. And like the specific need that we were trying to meet, we saw a lot of organizations that we worked with where they had deployed App scan, uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, watch fire as their dynamic testing engine and fortify as their static testing engine. And again, as the industry has uh, evolved and matured, IBM bought watch fire, HP bought fortify, now Microfocus bought, uh, you know, HPE software. Um, but, uh, you know, so organizations had these tools deployed and the vendors that owned them didn't necessarily have a strong, uh, you know, incentive to do a bunch of stuff together. And so the challenge we saw was a lot of folks had all this data that they, that they had been producing with their programs and they needed a way to combine that and make sense of that. Uh, is everybody here familiar with dynamic application security testing? You kind of act like Google, you're going to spider the application to, in, in this case, you're trying to discover the attack surface of the application. You start at page one, you know, look at the HTML and the JavaScript, look for all the links, go to the page two, go to page three, you know, so on and so forth. And so 
the dynamic scanning engines, they have to go out and spider to identify, uh, to get, you know, essentially guess or to discover the application's attack surface. Um, again, with some you know, authentication and session detection stuff, you've got to teach the scanner how to log in so that you can have a valid session cookie and whatnot. And once the scanner has identified that attack surface, it essentially goes through directed fuzzing to say, let's see if we can find vulnerable request and response patterns. I'm going to send in SQL control characters. If I get a JDBC error message back, that tells me there's probably a SQL injection vulnerability here. And that you know, typically produces results, or for our purposes, produces results. It's basically the vulnerability type, the relative URL in the application, and that entry point. What parameter, you know, for certain classes of vulnerabilities, like a SQL injection or cross-site scripting, what parameter was passed into the application um, you know, that resulted in this, uh, this response coming back? You know, looking at static application security testing, again, you're going to take the source or the binary, do some analysis on that to create a model, and then pour, perform additional analysis in order to identify potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And so you're going to do things like data flow analysis. You know, here where we see we've got this uh, request.get parameter call, that's going to return a tainted input. That gets assigned to the username variable, which is also then considered tainted. Um, the username variable, along with some static text, gets uh, appended together and assigned to the SQL variable. And then that tainted SQL variable gets passed into the sensitive function, which is execute. Again, a kind of a classic example of a, of a data flow analysis to find a SQL injection vulnerability. So what we wanted to do with hybrid analysis mapping is to figure out how do we take these results from different types of testing and identify where there are overlap situations. Um, so first thing we need to do is standardize on vulnerability types. Uh, we settled on the MITRE uh, Common Weakness Enumeration, or CWE. Uh, as I like to tell the folks at MITRE who maintain the CWE, the CWE is the worst vulnerability taxonomy available, except for all the other ones. All right, it, is, it is the democracy of uh, vulnerability uh, you know, taxonomies. And it actually works really well for our purposes. And a lot of the tool vendors have mappings back to CWE. Um, and so this is a case uh, where I think we could say uh, you know, standards or the attempt to create standards has been, uh, you know, has, has been very successful, or at least it's helped us a lot along our way. Then we need to match the static and dynamic locations. How do we know, if I have a, a code in a given file, how do I know where that code is going to get attached to the application attack service? So I want to send an HTTP request to a URL. How do I pick that URL so that that means a certain piece of code is going to run? And similarly, if I'm passing in a parameter, how do I know where that parameter that I send in my dynamic web request, how do I know or how do I find where that enters the application uh, source code to execute? And so in certain environments, in, you know, in, in certain languages and frameworks, if you think of like a raw PHP environment, like that's fairly easy to do that correlation, right? The file structure matches the URL structure. Uh, you know, great, that's, uh, you know, that's fairly easy. In other environments, like if you think about like a Java Spring environment or Struts or ASP.NET Web Forms, there's a translation that occurs according to different conventions uh, of like, hey, if you, if you send a request to this URL on the application, this is the code that's actually going to run and the file name where that's located is you know, totally uh, you know, not, not associated with the, with the uh, uh, you know, naming in the URL. A uh, sim similar thing with the parameter parsing. If I pass in this parameter, where does this actually get picked up in the application? And so what we do is we consume the source code and uh, you know, detect the language and framework, and we build this endpoint database. So what we essentially do, we've built the, the, the engine, detects the language and the framework, and then builds mappings where it says, here are all the URLs that the application will respond to and all the parameters that can be passed in. And here is the source code entry point that is responsible for that behavior in the system. <clears throat> you know, so to merge static and dynamic results, you basically say, well, I've got a dynamic result. I've got a reflected cross-site scripting uh, at the URL login.jsp for the username parameter. I can query that database, and it says, well, this is a Java Spring application. This is at com.whatever.whatever.login.controller.java-line62. Then if I go and look at my static results and I have a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability that enters that application in login controller.java line 62, I can say, I believe this is a match. I believe I have two pieces of evidence about one vulnerability, one static piece, one dynamic piece, as opposed to treating that as two different vulnerabilities. Magic. <clears throat> and so what we found was we could do some other interesting things with that. Again, we, were, we, we built this to solve a specific problem, but you know, in our discussion around the table, I talked to one of the engineers that was working on it. I said, well, it sounds like, you know, can we just do a different query 
on this data? Could, could, you know, could I, for example, do a select star uh, you know, equivalent on that data set? And that would give me all the URLs and all the associated parameters that the application could, you know, will respond to, regardless of whether or not there are vulnerabilities associated with those points in the attack surface. And the engineer you know, looked at it and said, yeah, we can, we can certainly do that. Uh, we can also do some interesting things where if you've done dynamic testing, but you haven't done static analysis, you can still query that data structure and get the entry point in the source code. And so that's something like in an IDE, for example, that we could map where we would say, hey, I've only done dynamic testing. Give me the URL and the parameter, and I'll show you where to start looking in the source code if you want to fix this vulnerability. It's not as good as having, you know, I mean, a lot of the static analysis tools have really good IDE plugins, and you can go and click through the full data flow and watch it, it steps through the, you know, the whole, uh, uh, you know, the, whole, the whole data or control flow. Uh, so it's not as good as, as that, but it's better than saying, well, hey, here's the request and response uh, developer. Go figure out where this hits your, you know, go figure out where this actually hits your application. And so there's some interesting things that we've that we found that we could do with this. Uh, and kind of the first example that we'll, that we'll look at is scanner seeding. Again, one of the challenges with dynamic testing is you don't necessarily, like you start out not knowing anything about the application attack surface. You say, well, here's the first page in the application. And again, maybe you've trained the scanner to log in so that you can see both you know, pages that require authentication as well as pages that don't require authentication. <clears throat> well, with this data structure that we've built, we've got, in theory, a list of all the URLs that the application will respond to and all the parameters that can change the behavior of the application. And so I can take that and feed that to the dynamic scanner. And that lets me then know about the application attack surface <clears throat> you know, before, we, uh, you know, before we even begin that process. And we'll, talk, uh, we'll talk more about this, and I'll demo this in just a second. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, just kind of some uh, you know, final thoughts on working with the uh, DHS uh, SBIR program. Uh, it, again, I think it's something that's been very interesting for us. It's allowed us to develop some neat technologies. Um, and if folks have questions about that, I'm certainly not an expert on it. But uh, again, we've been in the program for two, two and a half years. If anybody has questions about that, I'm happy as a side thing to answer any of that. Um, all the plugins that we're uh, talking about. Again, you can download from the links that I provided, or also if you go and build the, uh, the ThreadFix Community Edition from GitHub, you can, uh, you know, we've got a download link that you can just pull those tools down. Uh, and here's some instructions, again, for later on if you want to install the Zap plugin to look at the stuff that we're doing. <clears throat> and so from this attack surface enumeration, what we're, again, what we're going to find is all of the URLs, uh, all the parameters that are going to change the application behavior, and we're working, enhancing the system right now to add, you know, searching for cookies, HTTP headers, other points of attack surface. So why is this a problem? It's a problem because a lot of times you've got a dynamic testing engine that has to guess at the application attack surface. There may be things like hidden landing pages that link back into the application as a whole, but where you would never, if you started at the home page, you would never link out to that part of the application. You can also have multi-step processes where the scanner, for whatever reason, doesn't manage to get its way through the workflow. Uh, you may also have unknown parameters or debug parameters. I worked, uh, I worked on an application, a cold fusion application a while back. And for any page in the application, if you would pass in a parameter named D, it would delete the order that had the ID of whatever the value of that parameter was. Why not? <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and so, again, I don't think this was something malicious. I think it was a little tool that, uh, like a handy tool that the developer included that somehow got cut and pasted into every page in the, you know, every part of the application. Uh, but those are the types of things that you find, you know, that, again, unless you're the developer that wrote it and was thinking about it, or if, you're handed, if you have code handed over to you, those are the types of things that you probably won't know anything about and that a scanner is never going to find that because it's never going to see a reference to that parameter named D in any of the HTML or the JavaScript or the, you know, the traffic you get from exercising the application. Um, you know, this is also really useful if you have mobile applications that are being backed by you know, REST services and things like that. Because you can enumerate those, and then you know at least, uh, you know, from a dynamic standpoint, what, I, what we would typically do to identify REST endpoints is we would uh, you know, take the mobile application, feed it through like a burp uh, or a zap you know, out to the REST services, then we can watch the traffic that goes through. That's going to show us you know, some subset, maybe all of the REST APIs, 
But if you have the ground truth of here's all the APIs that are actually exposed, that gives you additional information where you may have, you may find situations where there's functionality exposed out in these REST APIs that you, you know, that again, you would not have discovered because it's not intended to be there, somebody forgot about it, or whatever else that might be. And so the benefits of using this attack surface data as a starting point for either automated scanning or pen testing is that you're going to reduce false negatives from scanners because you're going to get better coverage of the application for your standard fuzzing. And similarly, for manual pen testers, this gives them a lot of information that they can use to go in, ask questions, and, and understand more about the application. And again, identify situations where there may be things exposed that you wouldn't find through your standard dynamic uh, you know, enumeration methods. Um, so we've got a... Uh, a command line client that basically you point it at source code, it calculates this attack surface and then just dumps it out to the uh, command line. Uh, so we've got some instructions on that here and we can show you what that looks like in just a couple minutes. I have to do post talk stuff. <laughs> I shudder to think what else is going to pop up while we're doing these demos. There we go. There we go, a little bit bigger. Okay, this resolution's really doing me a lot of demo favors here. Okay, so you basically run this and point it at, you know, point it at a source code base, and ThreadFix uh, detects that it detects the language in the framework and dumps stuff out. And so what we see here looking at this uh, you know, ASP uh, web forms application, we have the very cleverly named uh, a, a hidden directory and hidden launch page right, that, you're, that you would not find you know, during a normal crawl because there's no links out to that. But by having access to that information, um, Again, we know, you know, hey, this is something. This is something we need to navigate to if we're doing dynamic testing. We want to, you know, hit that page. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like there's any parameters, so we maybe there's not a lot there to fuzz. But from a manual pen testing standpoint, I've got a question of like, what exactly is that page there doing uh, about? <clears throat> and as you saw, like that ran pretty uh, fast. Um, just to give you an idea of, like, to compare this attack surface calculation to a standard static analysis. Uh, let's run this. It complains about the git directory. There we go. And so that was just running. Uh, we, we just ran the attack surface calculation against the ThreadFix uh, code base, which is yeah, 100 and some odd thousand lines of code. And so um, what we're doing is like a, like, a, like a tokenized parsing. We're not doing full data flow analysis, control flow analysis, or anything like that. Um, so it's much faster. You know, the, the obvious downside of that is because we're not doing, you know, full data flow or control flow analysis, we're not finding those types of, you know, the vulnerabilities you would identify from that. Um, but again, from a, from a speed standpoint, the, the technology is able to chew through this stuff pretty, uh, you know, chew through this stuff pretty quickly. There we go. <clears throat> uh, so what we've also done is we've built plugins for Zap and Burp and also AppScan. Um, that I think may or may not, but it should be available soon if it's not already released. Um, but, so we can go in and, let's say that we're looking at this budget store. With the plugin, we can go and say, tools import from source. I'm gonna import the source code for budget. I'm gonna point it at the running version of the application. And we can clearly see from the voluminous screen real estate I have here. <laughs> uh, but, so just to show here, what you can see is, uh, so we identified by preceding the scan, we found this admin.jsp page that you would not have found otherwise if you hadn't been logged in as an administrator. Right? And, and again, if you look at the application, what you find is that, you know, that particular page you can get to without being authenticated, which you probably shouldn't be able to do. 
uh, what you also find is that a number of these pages um, will accept this parameter named debug. What does that do? I don't know, but as a manual pen tester, that's certainly really interesting to me, and it's also probably something I'd like to fuzz, uh, you know, just in case it touches a SQL database or something like that. All right. And so by preceding this scan with the knowledge that we have of the application's attack surface, that lets us get a much more thorough coverage when testing the application. Uh, and it gives us, if we're doing manual penetration testing, it gives us the ability to, uh, or it gives us you know, additional insight into things that may be interesting that we want to look at. So. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> what we can also do is start to use visualization to look at these things. So we can start to look at what, um, you know, for a given application, we can start to look at what are the different pages um, that are exposed, what are the different parameters that exposed, you know, for a simple application like Budget or for a much larger application like ThreadFix, um, <clears throat> where again, here we're enumerating all the different attack surface. And we can also start to look at how this attack surface changes over time. So I can take version one of the application, calculate the attack surface, then you know, wait a while, go to version two of the application, calculate that attack surface, and we can see how that evolves over time. And that lets us start to do some, uh, some additional interesting stuff. There we go. <clears throat> because what we can do if we have if, if we have attack surface that we've looked at you know, multiple points over time, we can run diffs of that and start to understand, hey, between this commit in the application and this next commit in the application, here's how that attack surface has changed. And so from a, from a fuzz testing or an automation testing standpoint, if you're looking at, well, we did, you know, the last time that we did a test was here. We just checked in a bunch more code. Here's what our uh, you know, head commit is here. Let's do a diff between the last time this Jenkins job ran and the current time where the, where the state of, 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 uh, of, of the Git repository is. And that'll let us identify, here are the new, uh, you know, here are the new pages that have been exposed or new parameters that have been exposed as well. <clears throat> and again, that may let me, what I can do is I can feed that data to something like Zap and tell Zap, I only want you to do automated testing against this part of the application because that's going to get our runtime down to something that is potentially much more manageable. You know, similarly, if you're looking at tracking manual testing over time, you know, you can understand the last time that we did manual testing of this application was at this point uh, in the code's evolution. Now we're at this commit. Show me all the new stuff that has shown up or show me things that have gone away since the last time we did this testing. And based on that, let's focus our manual testing efforts on the parts of the application that haven't been subject to that type of inspection yet. Again, the, the concern here is I have a limited, you know, I, I have a limited runtime that I'm allowed to, you know, where I can insert myself into that build process. <clears throat> you know, so I have to keep my tool runtimes down to this much if I want to have these synchronous testing tasks where I can weigh in on passing or failing a build. Or similarly, we've got a manual testing program, but we, for whatever reason in this current job market, we don't have all the testers that we want. Um, you know, we've got a couple job recs open because we don't have enough capacity to do this testing. Let me make sure I'm focusing those testers on where they are most likely to find new and serious vulnerabilities that have been introduced to the system. What we can also do is start to pull together metrics. Uh, One moment. <clears throat> where we can start to look and make decisions where we say, let's see what, uh, let's see what, app, uh, you know, let's look at where we were before in the size of the attack surface and where we are now. And we can set up a policy that says, once the attack surface has changed by 5% or 10%, or once the attack surface has grown by 20 URLs or 15 parameters or whatever that might be, 
you can start to put thresholds in there to say, at this point, we believe the application has changed enough from the last time that we did a full static analysis or the last time we did a full dynamic analysis or the last time we had a thorough manual test. You can start to use those to set thresholds to trigger events where you would initiate those longer running activities so that you can essentially true up. Uh, again, as you because as you go over time, you, the level or the quality of your security inside is going to change if you've only been doing scanning of stuff when it showed up, uh, when, when it was new parts of the attack surface. You need to dead reckon where you're at by essentially going back and saying, let's redo these activities. Um, and again, by being able to calculate the, uh, you know, again, either on a percentage or on a raw URL or parameter basis, you know, this lets you then negotiate uh, and look at your budget of here are the resources that we have. Uh, let's determine what thresholds we want to set so that we can balance between the available resources that we have and we can spread those across the portfolio of applications that we're trying to secure. Okay, so and I've talked about a lot of this stuff, um, but again, uh, you know, this lets you target your DAS testing to limit your run times. It lets you th set potentially th set thresholds for when you need to do manual assessments, penetration testing. Um, you know, and also some, one of the things we're playing around with is you know basically gluing this into Slack and HipChat so that when developers make commits that introduce new attack surface, that's something the team is made aware of. What we want to do is provide that situational awareness to the team so that they understand how the application is evolving over time. As new URLs show up, as you know, as, as URLs may be retired or renamed, you know that provides some insight to the development team so they can watch that as it evolves over time. Uh, and I think, uh, I didn't see it. We've got a, uh, there's another GitHub repository that has all the uh, code that we use to generate those uh, models and whatnot. Um, I'll include those, I'll include, I didn't see it, or I don't remember seeing it, so I'll, if it's not there, I'll make sure that it's in there. Um, but this is something that we're you know, kind of actively working on with a number of different organizations. And so you know, right now we're expanding the model, the application attack surface, Right now we look at parameters and HTTP verbs. Uh, in the future we're going to be working on HTTP headers. Um, and we also are introducing the concept of auth authentication requirement as well as uh, authorization requirements for different URLs. Uh, so essentially with that model you'll have a lens to be able to say, okay, well I've got 100 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Show me which of those are, can be accessed by an unauthenticated user and which ones can only be you know, accessed by a an unauthenticated or a, a, an authenticated user, uh, again, to allow folks to take this data they're getting out of their testing programs and to focus in more on things that matter. I'm probably concerned more about uh, unauthenticated SQL injections than I am about authenticated SQL injections. Uh, also, better visualization. I'm not a visualization guy, um, but I learned enough D3JS to crap together some visualizations. So um, that's something I think where, again, that's uh, you know, to provide that situational awareness both to development teams as well as to testers so that they can see the evolution over time as, uh, you know, as applications you know, get new URLs, get new parameters as things go away. Um, you know, that's helpful for folks as they're trying to, again, understand a little bit more about their application, but also for people that are doing testing to be able to understand more about the application so that they can focus their time and resources accordingly. Yeah, so the question is about false positives. How do we deal with false positives? Like the challenge is that we're on, if you think of like sophisticated analysis, by, by that I mean like full data flow, cross method control flow analysis, um, like we're on the receiving end of just like whatever the tool, you know, be it Fortify or check marks or Veracode or whatever, like we're just at the receiving end of that. Um, and so what we have seen folks use just from a data management standpoint is to look and potentially prioritize vulnerabilities that have been, that have been correlated first to say, you know, hey, we believe this is a, uh, like, you know, we have two pieces of evidence, both the dynamic scanner and the static scanner found this, therefore I believe this is less likely to be a false positive, um, you know, and, and more serious that we need to respond to, whereas the other stuff we have less confidence in that. That's one way I've seen organizations use the data. Uh, also, another thing I'll say about getting these, the testing integrated into the CICD pipeline, you know, you, if false, sending false positives to developers is a very bad thing, right? Because it, you, know, it, like you have so much credibility, you, know, you have X amount of credibility, and every time you send a false positive over, you, you know, chip away at that or hack away at that, depending on the organization. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen, if you want to start integrating security testing into the DevOps pipeline, you've got to tune the tools so that you're 
focused on, you know, so that the tools with the rule sets they're using and the configuration are identifying the high likelihood, high impact vulnerabilities. And there's also typically, I, I see it as like an onboarding process of let's run the initial scans with whatever tools we're using with the application, cull out all of the false positives. That gives us a clean set of data to start with. And the hope is that we, that, that gives you more confidence in, in the incremental runs if you're going to be like auto creating bugs and things based on those. You've at least got a clean data set that you're starting from. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'll be around if anybody has questions. So. This is a gift for him, uh, nope. last time. Thank so thank you, Dan, very much. Thank you.